All right, welcome back all you beautiful bulletproof handymen and women. We're going to talk about business models today and there are tons and tons of them in this industry. And the reason you need to have a business model is because if you don't have a business model, that means you don't know who your clients are. And if you don't know who your clients are, you can't figure out what their needs are. And if you can't figure out what their needs are, you can't fill their needs. And therefore, you're not going to be a good service provider. One quick example, just two very opposing ideas, is if you're mostly focusing on remodels then you can make all your remodel customers happy. You can tell them that this is what you do. You can tell them, I've got this remodeled schedule that'll end in the middle of next month, and then I've got a bathroom remodel scheduled after that that's gonna take me about two weeks, and then I'll put you on the list to be the next one if you wanna go ahead and make your deposit right now. However, if you're doing those remodels and at the same time you're trying to fill the needs of clients who have leaky sinks, broken air conditioners, or things that need to be fixed quickly, you can't serve both. So one of two things is gonna happen. Your client's remodels are gonna be left half done for weeks upon weeks unnecessarily because you're spending half your time running out there fixing leaky sinks, and your leaky sinks are gonna remain leaking longer than they should because you're spending half your time doing remodels. That's just one quick example. <clears throat> but you do need to know your business model so what we're about to do is just go down this list and i've made a list of just all the different types of models it's not model by model it's more questions that you answer and once you refine that answer imagine a big flow chart right and at the top is handyman and under handyman in fact let's get started under handyman you have let's say part-time and full-time the way you run a part-time business is not going to be the same way you run a full-time business some of the differences that you'll experience if you're part-time versus full-time is your overhead so the overhead may be basically the same you may be using the same software you may be paying about the same amount of money for insurance you're going to use less gasoline because you're not going out as much but let's say that your handyman business overhead pretend like it's $100 a month. It's gonna be far more, but pretend like it's $100 a month. So if you have $100 a month overhead and you do $100 a month worth of work because you're full, because you're part-time, then you've made $0. Your, your overhead is 100% of the revenue. If you make $500 with $100 overhead, now your overhead is 20% of your revenue. So as you scale this up, the more hours you're putting into the business, <clears throat> the bigger percentage of your total revenue stays in your pocket. And that doesn't mean you shouldn't be part-time, it just means you need to be making these types of decisions ahead of time. And uh, also, I just wanna throw a little extra in there. If you're part-time and you're doing a great job, I can tell you right off the bat, unless you're already making six figures a year at your current job, if you're part-time and you're doing a great job and keeping your clients happy, you will be full-time soon. It'll just become very obvious. Your name will get around, people will start calling you, they will be willing to pay you almost whatever they need to pay you. I do suggest you don't gouge them, please, but you will be able to charge way better rates for your time as a qualified handyman who's doing a reliable job in a professional way than you'll ever make it any hourly job. So you'll, you'll grow into full-time even if you start out part-time. Next is going to be a, a big, big, big one here that you need to choose from is are you going to be residential or commercial? Those are two very, very different clients with two very, very, very different needs. Everything is different between the residential and the commercial world. And let's go over a few of the differences. Number one, uh, if you're commercial, they're almost certainly going to require a license. Now, this is not always true. I used to do some work for a few commercial companies on commercial properties, and they didn't require that I had any type of licensing, as long as, of course, I was following the law here in Arizona, not doing jobs over $1,000, not doing jobs that required a permit, etc. But they're probably going to require a license. If you want to make that your full-time thing, you're going to need a license for that, meaning like a contractor's license or a specialty contractor's license. Also, in the commercial world, the pay is often much higher. Um, and that there's, there's reasons for that. That's not necessarily a great thing. But the pay is often higher in the commercial world. You can charge more money. <clears throat> Next, the, <clears throat> the knowledge is less general. So if you're working on residential homes, 
the knowledge base you're going to need to do that is pretty general. There, there's a big world of things to learn for residential homes. And once you've learned them, you're not likely to see a whole lot of new things. The longer you do this, the more rare it's going to be for you to come upon something that you don't know anything about and haven't done before. But in the commercial world, there's gonna, it's always going to be new. I can tell you all one example. There was one time over the course of three weeks when I was doing a little bit of commercial work. Over the course of three weeks, I got three different requests from the same like parent company who was managing maintenance for some smaller commercial properties. I got three different requests for exhaust fans and bathrooms that weren't working. I don't know why that came through so quickly with all three of them in a short period of time. But what I found was all three of those fans were very different from each other. They were not the same type or style or fit or form or function. Very different fans, all three of them. And another thing on the list that ties into this with that less general knowledge and those three fans being different is none of those fans were available locally. So each and every one of them, I had to go to the property to fix the fan, take a look at the fan, realize it needed to be replaced. I called every supply house that I could find here. And I'm not saying there wasn't one anywhere in town. Perhaps there was people I didn't call. But the point being that with residential, your exhaust fans, there's basically two types you're going to find. And you're not going to find any other types. I've been doing this <clears throat> full time, three and a half years, hundreds of exhaust fans in rental homes. And they have always been the same two types and 90% of them have been one specific type. Whereas with a commercial, three different types of fans in three weeks, all three were very different, had to order all three, make a separate trip back to the property for all three. So it's far less general and the parts availability is going to be a little harder for you. That's going to require a lot of different logistics for you to figure out for your business to make it run smoothly. Also with commercial, the response time is usually urgent. And that doesn't mean they're going to fire you if you can't get over there today. But generally speaking with residential, especially with property managers, but with residential, something that isn't urgent isn't usually treated as urgent. They're okay with you doing urgent jobs first, like emergency jobs first, urgent jobs second, and then non-urgent jobs third. In the commercial world, Everything is urgent. If the exhaust fan in the bathroom isn't working, it's not just a couple people who live in that house who just have a lack of exhaust fan for a few days. At a business, it's going to be hundreds of people that go into that bathroom. It's going to smell worse and worse and worse. They just can't have that. But they just treat everything as urgent. And oftentimes it is urgent. And oftentimes I think it's just part of that world over there. They just have a mindset of everything being more urgent. And then here's a really big one with commercial properties. You're going to almost always find that their payment terms are net 90. And what that means is they have 90 days to pay you. So from the moment you finish that job, close out the work order and submit the invoice, they have 90 days to pay you. With property management, most of them are net 30. I've seen some net 45s also and a net 60 here and there. But generally with property management, you're looking at net 30. And then also, of course, with homeowners, typically the expectation is they're paying you upon completion. So those are all different models right there. Just between the residential and the commercial world, you have all of these big differences. And you can't do one correctly and the other correctly to the best of your ability. You can't do both of these to the best of your ability. You're going to sacrifice something for one in order to put effort into the other. Next, let's talk about licensed versus unlicensed. This is, at, at once, this doesn't matter and it also really matters. It doesn't matter in the short term. And what I mean by that is you can get started as a handyman today without a license. Handymen generally are not expected to have a license. It's almost part of the definition of a handyman. Not my definition of a handyman, but it's almost part of the definition of a handyman in general with the general public is they don't, they assume you don't have a license going into it. So whether or not you get licensed, here's some of the things that it's going to make a difference on how you run your business. Number one, just easily, if you have a license, you can charge more. Getting a license is essentially getting permission to charge more. 
uh, the opportunities you experience with a license are going to open up. That is partly because of state laws. For example, here in Arizona, I can't do jobs over $1,000 and I can't do electrical plumbing or HVAC jobs that require a permit. So that limits the jobs. I, I don't have as many opportunities because I don't have a license. I'll be getting mine soon enough. I'm just not in a hurry. I'm making great money already. I'm busy seven days a week. It's not at the top of my priority list, but it is a step that I'll be taking to grow this business over the next decade. But you will have more opportunities. You'll also have, as an example, there will be homeowners that just simply, even if it's the simplest little thing that doesn't require a license, there will be homeowners who just simply won't work you if you don't have a license. They want to pay a little extra and know that the guy working on their house, even if it's just a leaky, leaky sink, has a license. Um, licenses, however can be expensive. And this varies state by state. Every state is different, but licenses can get very expensive. Typically, you're going to have some annual fee that you have to pay to maintain your license, or maybe it'll be a biannual or semi-annual or every five years, but there will be some sort of fee you're paying to maintain your license. You may or may not have to retake certain tests after X number of years to maintain your license. You have to maintain bonding, and your bonding amount depends on Think of bonding as insurance. It's not insurance, but think of bonding like insurance. The more work you're doing, the higher volume of work you're doing, the higher the probability of something going wrong. Also, the more expensive per job, the more expensive the work is, the higher the, the probability that that bonding is going to have to pay out. So to the extent you intend on being successful and having plenty of business, that bonding is going to cost you a pretty little penny. There's also a lot of rules that come along with having a license. If you're a licensed contractor in most states, they do have rules about how you do bookkeeping and about how you communicate with clients in terms of things that you have to, uh, what's the word, what's the word, disclose to your clients. So that's going to be a difference. Um, and yeah, just lots of extra rules when you have a license. Having a license puts you within an organization that can remove your license, and they're going to have state by state, they're going to have different standards on what's required to maintain that license. Uh, uh, let's see. Bigger jobs, kind of as I mentioned before, state by state, you're going to have different uh, requ you're going to have different limits set on what you can do if you're unlicensed. So you can do bigger jobs with a license, which again opens up more opportunities. But you may not want to do big jobs, so that's okay. And then finally, as I sort of already mentioned, license getting a contractor's license, whether it's a specialty license, a small remodel license, just a carpenter's license, there's so many different types, but having some sort of contractor's license to open up those new opportunities is almost necessary for growth. And maybe you don't want to grow. Maybe your goal is to just be a one-man show for the next 20 years, provide for your family, go camping, shoot some guns, drink some beer, that's absolutely fine. But if you do want to grow, have that on your radar that getting a license is going to be one of the steps that your business will take in order to grow. So this is going to bring us to my favorite topic when it comes to picking business models because this had a huge impact on the growth of my business, and that is direct-to-consumer versus third-party right? So what that means is the consumer, let's say you work for a homeowner, you're working on that homeowner's home, and they are the ones responsible for paying you. That's direct to consumer. Third party would be when, say, a residential property manager, a commercial property manager, maybe a real estate agent is asking you to do work. They're requesting the work. They're going to be responsible for payment, but they're farming work out to you for lots of other people. It's not done on their house or their business. It's being done on other people's houses or businesses. And that's what third party is. So as an example, I work exclusively for property management companies. That's how I grew my company. I was very lucky to find this field. But what I've found, and I'll just dive into some of the differences, what I found there's a very big difference in the vetting process, which has a lot to do with how long it's going to take you to scale up to somewhere where you have a really good base of loyal clients that respect you, that you respect, that treat you well, that pay their bill on time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So with vetting, let's say you have a homeowner. 
you go and uh, they need a new toilet, right? And something's wrong with the toilet. You figure it out. You say, hey, you need a new toilet. They pay you for a new toilet. Once you're done with that customer, hopefully they were a good one, but you find out through this process if you enjoyed working with them, if they were professional, if they paid you on time. And then that customer, until they need you again, is no longer a customer. They're eventually going to contact you again someday. If you're on the ball, you're contacting them infrequently every now and then and just saying, hey, just checking in, seeing if you need anything. But you vet them, and then the next customer you have, you have to vet them. And along the way, this is just my opinion, I'm going to say roughly half of all the people out there are not great customers that you want to build a long-term relationship with. So you end up doing a lot of vetting before you get yourself, and I don't know how many it would take, 25, 50, 100, 200 vetted clients that you know you enjoy working with and that you know you want to continue working with. With property management, when you're working for third parties who have a lot of work to farm out, you do have to vet them exactly the same way. And the ratio is still probably 50-50 between good ones and bad ones. It may even be a little bit worse. But what I like about it is once you have a good property manager that sends you plenty of work, uh, treats you professionally while you treat them professionally, pays on time, when all of those boxes are checked and you have a good property manager, once you've vetted them and you're in that position, they're a client forever, basically, and they will just keep sending you money. And the analogy I always use is having property managers is like having little machines on the wall over here that just spit out work orders. They just, you don't have to go looking for it. You don't have to advertise with Google. You don't have to go pay for leads. You've now got a machine on the wall and every now and then it just spits out work that you didn't have to make any effort to obtain other than the effort that you put in to give them a very good experience working with you. And then you get another property manager. That's another machine. Get another property manager. Now you got another machine. And before you know it, you've just got machines just spitting out work orders and you can just grab those all up and run with them. That's what I really like about what I do. It's not uh, superior to any other method. There are a lot of bonuses to working for homeowners. In fact, one of those bonuses is going to be over time. And it does take much longer to get here unless you got lucky or unless you just truly are the most outstanding handyman who's ever existed. But with homeowners, if you can get to a wealthy enough clientele, you can find yourself making far more money for your own personal time, for each individual hour that you put on the job with tools in your hands. You can, in the long run, make more money. However, running a business like mine, my goal is to eventually not be the guy on the job with the tools in my hands. My goal is to eventually be the guy who's communicating with property managers, driving to addresses to look at what's going on to do an estimate, uh, you know, have an office manager who's doing a lot of the scheduling and job creation and invoicing and stuff. So you can scale them both to a higher number, but that's the big difference right there is the vetting and then, like I said, in the end, it's also going to be the money that you can make in terms of how you make it. You can scale my style business by actually scaling with more people and more jobs and more clients. You can scale the other side working for homeowners by slowly working your way up the ladder to a wealthier clientele who doesn't mind paying. I do think there's a little extra risk in that, but you know, that's every person's decision how much risk they want to take. And if you know what you're doing, there's not that much risk either way. Uh, little to no marketing, like I said, with the machines on the wall, just pl printing out work orders and the steady work with the property management. Like I was saying, the work is just very steady over time and my clients are very loyal, but you can have loyal homeowner clients as well. Next big difference is, uh, let's call it job size. What size jobs are you doing? So for me, I do, since I'm working for property managers, I, I got to figure out what they value the most. And this is what you'll need to do no matter what business model you have. You're going to need to know who your clients are so that you can figure out what they value so that you can provide them with that value to make them happy to give you money for that value. So the job size is going to make a lot of difference. As I said in the beginning, you can't be doing giant remodels and fixing leaky sinks. It's not that you can't. I suppose you can. But you're not going to do either of them the best that they can be done. Each one of those is going to compete with the other. 
So some of the differences, whether you're going to do new construction, remodels and renovations, or smaller repairs, is going to be job length, of course. So if you're going to be at one address remodeling a house, let's say helping somebody do a flip, maybe you got an investor that you're doing this for, and he just buys houses and you flip them with this investor. So the job length is going to be one of the big differences. You're going to be working on one job site for three weeks, two months, three months, six months, who knows? It depends on how big the job is. But that job length is going to dictate how you run your business. So for me, if I was working on something like that, I'd probably have a trailer and all my tools would stay in the trailer. And when I start the job, I'd park the trailer at the house, get it all nice and locked up. And every day I would just drive my regular grocery getter back and forth to that house, open up the trailer for my tools. As opposed to doing what I do, smaller repairs, but lots of them, my job length is very small. Usually my job length is less than an hour for every single job. There are bigger ones too. I'm doing a lot of move outs now, so those can be full days. But the point is when you're doing repairs as opposed to renovations, you're probably going to want to have like a van or whatever vehicle you use. You're going to want to have everything you need with you all the time. And you're going to want to have smaller tools so that you can fit them all in there. Like you're not going to be trying to bring a big giant job site table saw to every single little tiny handyman job if you're doing small jobs. Uh, skills required. These may be the same or they may be different. What I can say is as a handyman doing mostly the smaller jobs but more and more and more of them, I think I can say overall you need fewer skills. If you're trying to do big renovations and remodels, uh, for example, I'm never going to tile a whole house. I'm never going to carpet a whole house. I'm never going to change all the windows in an entire house. I'm never going to re-roof an entire roof because that's not what I do. I don't specialize in providing whole house services that are more akin to remodels. I specialize in the little stuff. But if you're trying to do remodels, you need to be able to provide all the services that they need on that remodel. And one of those services or many of those services are going to be bigger skills that you're going to have to learn. So to get started doing it the way I do it with the smaller jobs up to like one or two day jobs at the most, you're going to need fewer skills. And if you want to get into the remodels, you're going to need more skills. And I do still believe you can learn all those on the job but it's much, much, much more difficult. I do not recommend it. There will be more headaches. There will be more failures. There will be more times that you have to eat a lot of money because you didn't invest it properly. You didn't estimate the job properly. But that's a thing that's going to be happening. Um, let's see. Same with skills required. Oh, financial planning is going to change depending on the job size. And, and depending, actually, financial management is going to change on all of these. Every aspect that I'm giving you to choose between, how you manage your finances will change. But one of the biggest areas is going to be job size. So I do all these little jobs. And what that means is I get sent a work order, you know, print it right off the wall. I, go, I get sent a work order. I schedule with a tenant. I show up. I do the job. I invoice. And then over time, you know, within the next 30 days, those payments come in. So what I need to do for my financial planning is I need to know, for example, I know that I need at least four grand in the bank just for materials, just for the week. That's to cover me and my son and a couple other guys who do some work for me. But that's the safe number. I have to have a minimum of four grand in the bank that's going to be constantly churning through. It's going to go down, it's going to go up as invoices come in, and then I spend more on materials and labor. But that's how I need to manage my finances for my business. If I was doing a remodel, it'd be very different. If somebody wanted a big remodel, let's say if I was legal to, let's say a $25,000 remodel, and this is going to include two different bathrooms, a lot of other items all throughout the house, new exterior paint, all these things added up, 25 grand. And I'm going to say yes to this job. I'm going to need to manage my finances in such a way that I get a very large deposit from them right off the bat to invest into materials and perhaps into some tools that I need as well. And then because this job's going to take me, let's call it a month, because it's going to take a month, I can't get just materials money up front and then work for free for the next month until I finish the job and then expect one bulk lump sum payment. Number one, that's dangerous because if you have a falling out with a client, 
and you've just about finished the job, they may or may not pay you. And yes, they'll have to pay you eventually, but you're going to need a lawyer to make that happen, and you can't afford to just wait months and months and months for a court case to resolve. So you're going to have to get a big deposit at the beginning, and then you're going to have to have a schedule of payments with milestones set up throughout that job. That's a very different skill than doing what I do, and that's a very different skill than doing smaller jobs for individual homeowners as well. Uh, you're going to have... Uh, let's see, where are we at? Yeah, competition uh, with rates. And this is going to vary all over the map as well. But generally speaking, if you can get really good at the home remodels, like really, really, really good at this, I think you can make more money, again, for your time, for your individual hours spent on the job, you can make more money with the remodels per your hour of labor than you can doing what I'm doing. I can make, let's let's call it a max of a thousand a day. Maybe, I, I've, I've made more than a thousand in a day by getting really lucky and doing a really great job of tight scheduling and being efficient with my time. But for me, my max is really looking like about a thousand a day, unless I just have extremely higher rates and I don't wanna raise my rates. I, I raise them slowly over time, but I don't wanna just bump my rates straight up. All my clients are happy, I'm happy, money's flowing, we're all good. I'm not gonna mess that up by trying to get expensive. But yeah, if you're doing those bigger jobs, oftentimes when you get very good at them, you can walk away from that. You could be making 2000 a day, and that's just going to take experience to get there. Um, however, with what I'm doing with the property management, there's less competition. So this is, this is sort of a competition versus rates thing. The rates can be higher for the homeowners if and when you get the wealthy homeowners and get great, but the competition is less for me. I can grab up property managers anytime I want to. I can fire a property manager and go get a new one this week or three new ones this week and then vet two of them out and keep them one that's the best. I can do that. The skills that go into managing what I'm managing, this is more about logistics than skill and I've gotten very good at the logistics, but that's gonna be a big thing is you're gonna have less competition over here on my side, but you're gonna have better rates over there on the other side. And then finally, for the big jobs versus the small jobs is regulations and licensing. When you're doing bigger jobs and remodels, you're, you're going to have to have a license. You're going to have to have like a residential remodel license or whatever your state calls that particular type of license. But that's just going to become a necessary thing that you have to do. Whereas over here, what I'm doing, like I said, I'll get a license, but you don't have to have one. Next thing to choose between, are you going to be an owner-operator or are you trying to be a business owner with other people working for you? And there are plenty of gray areas in between, but that's a big difference. Owner-operator means you've got the truck, you've got the tools, you've got the clients, you've got the hands and the skills, and you're going out and doing the work, which limits your income to what you can do with your body and your skills versus owner only, if you're just trying to be a business owner and you're not the guy doing the work, I don't know much about that field, so I'm not going to be able to teach you much. I'm, st I'm stepping into that field slowly and learning as I go, but I'm not in a position where I should be giving you advice because I haven't yet succeeded in that field. I'll probably be moving into it a whole lot this year, more towards the end of the year, um, but you're going to need startup funds, number one to just have a startup where you're the owner and you're not the guy doing the work. You're going to need more planning. You're going to need much more investment of everything. That means you're going to have employees and having employees means you're going to need to do tax things and workman's comp things and worry about unemployment insurance and all the government regulations, both state and federal and local. So that's a big, big, big difference. Although I do assume that if you're watching this channel and you're watching this masterclass, you're probably going the owner operator route because if you have the skills to go the owner only with employees working for you route, if, if you've got the skills to do that, you don't really need to be watching this channel. You're not going to learn much from this if you're already good enough at business that you know how to do that and you're going to succeed at that. And finally, uh, let's see, as far as who's doing the work, this ties into the last one a little bit, but it is, uh, actually, no. No, it doesn't. This is the same. I'm just going to scratch this all out. This is kind of a repeat of the last one. So finally, 
Finally, very last one, guys, is specialization or handyman, or call it specialization or multi-trade. I like the phrase multi-trade. I'm starting to get into that word. I don't think it's going to catch on, but I really do like it. I feel like that's more what I'm doing is multi-trade rather than handyman. Uh, but specialization would be, for an example, you're going to be a pressure washing company because this, this whole video series and my entire channel, that would apply to a pressure washing company. It would apply to an electrician. It would apply to a plumber, a roofer, a landscaper, anybody who's in the trades. All of this information applies. Um, but with specialization, you're going to have fewer startup costs because you're going to need fewer tools. However, you're going to have more competition. So you might be able to, let's say, go buy a pressure washer, some chemicals, whatever else you need to run that business, do some Google ads and whatnot, get your name out, start getting clients, and all you've got to do is just have your limited set of equipment and skills and show up and just do that one job really good over and over. However, that's easier to do than being a handyman or a multi-tradesman, and the reason it's easier is because you need one set of equipment, one set of skills. You can zoom in all of your focus just on one thing. Your startup costs are lower, so you're going to have more competition because everybody else. I had a friend when I was working at Bombardier who wanted to start a carpet cleaning company. He found out you can get into that for under 10 grand, and he started doing the math and going, yeah, I'm going to get out there and clean. Even if I only charge $35 per room, I can still make this much money. And before you knew it, he had a whole... Before you knew it, in his head, he had franchised out across the U.S. and was just sitting back raking in the dough. Other people have those similar dreams when they find out you can get into a specialization more quickly and easily, more of them try to do it. So you have a saturated market with more competition. Trying to be a handyman is very, very different. If we define handyman the way I defined it at the beginning of this series, meaning that we're not unskilled labor, we're actually very skilled labor, and our biggest skill is that we've made sure that we have, let's call it 80% knowledge in every field. So it's not that we can do literally everything better than everybody, it's that we can do just about everything to a satisfactory level, and we know where to draw that line and recommend that we bring a specialist in. That's going to require more more time, more tools, more experience, more investment all across the board. It's going to require a lot more management. It's going to require a lot more confidence and a lot more skill building on the job. But those are very different ones and you do need to know ahead of time. Am I starting a pressure washing company or a painting company or am I starting a handyman slash multi-trade company? Those are going to make a big difference. And then finally, guys, what I want to close this with is I did not start my business where it's at today. I started my business thinking that I was going to be the special guy doing the special projects for the special rich people way up in the foothills. That was my dream. That was my plan. That's what I was working towards. And then I found property management. I was keeping my eyes and ears open. I was always surveying the market and the industry. And I found property management. And when I did, I saw the potential. And I just made a complete 180 and went the other direction. I went from wanting to do the biggest, most expensive projects for the richest people to focusing in on doing the lowest least profitable or not profitable but least expensive projects most of my jobs are 125 dollars because it's just a trip fee to show up and i knock the job out in five minutes they're all very small jobs for the most part but keep your eyes and ears open you do need to go into this with a business model and you need to know what that model is you need to know what your pricing structure is you need to have all these questions answered so that you can focus in on doing what you do better than anyone else who's doing what you do but that doesn't mean you have to stay there keep your eyes and ears open if you find out that you have a particular affinity maybe you need to roll somebody's roof one day and put a new coating on the roof and you just, you made a lot of money doing it. The client was really happy. You enjoyed doing it. You like being outside, even in the cold and even in the heat. If everything lines up and you see a path forward and you see a client base, you can go chase that. Just like I shut down what I was doing over here and started chasing property management. So always keep that in mind. This doesn't have to stick. 
you just need to start with a plan because if you don't, you're just going to be jumping around everywhere. And before you know it, what you're really going to find yourself doing is just trying to make money for this week's bills. You're just always going to be chasing a dollar. And as long as you're chasing a dollar, that's reactive. Chasing a dollar is reacting to the environment around you as opposed to pursuing a business model which is proactive. You're making plans and you're pursuing those plans. You have a list of steps and you're marking them off and you're progressing. So with that being said, uh, I love you guys. I hope this class is helping you a lot. I'm trying to get it filmed as fast as I can. If you're doing this on the website, then I've already finished filming it and it's all ready. But for those of you who are watching it as I drop it on YouTube, I'm going to try to get these done as quick as I can for you. I'm putting real effort into it. And until next time, I love y'all and I hope you're all out there killing it.